Welcome to another video. Today, we're looking at an audio component from a company with such an extreme emphasis on design that their stylish products are known as trend-setting works of art in the tech industry. That company is, of course, Bang & Olsen of Denmark. I bet you thought I was going to say Apple, right? Nope, it's Bang & Olsen. And this is the B.O. Cord 6000. What is this thing? A calculator? A computer? Control panel from a spaceship? No, it's a cassette deck from the early 1980s. But it doesn't look like your typical cassette deck at all, does it? That looks weird. Why on earth would someone make a cassette deck that looks like this? It's the future of tape decks. Hmm. Well, the future turned out a little differently than these guys imagined. It's very interesting to draw some parallels between Bang & Olsen and Apple. First is the extreme emphasis on design in each company. They value the user experience to such an extreme that it drives their technology in very different directions than the competition. This ad, for example, shows a group of Japanese guys who are perplexed by this design. B&O wants to look very different than other audio components being manufactured at the time. Both Apple and Bang & Olufsen also spawn their own celebrity designer. You may well have heard of Johnny Ive of Apple. Well, Jacob Jensen, who designed this BioCord 6000 cassette deck and a lot of other products, had his work from B&O exhibited in the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1978. Another similarity is the way they brand products. Much like Apple has the I prefix, B&O has B.O. For example, the B.O. cord is a tape recorder. B.O. grams are their turntables and CD players. B.O. masters the receiver and so forth. There are some exceptions like these U70 headphones and the telephones they produced were B.O. com, not B.O. phone. But it's a very similar naming strategy to Apple. And like Apple, they don't necessarily care about being compatible with other equipment. This B.O. Cord 6000 has a couple of these 5-pin DIN connectors, which are a lot harder to find than the standard RCA cables at the time. Another similarity to Apple is the amount of study of the company. So many books have been written about its products and culture, and there are active internet forums and collectors even today. And, of course, like Apple, the passionate fans eventually draw snickering parodies and jibes, like this scene from National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, where a pair of obnoxious yuppies have their banging Olsen-like stereo destroyed by a flying missile of ice. Obviously, something had to break the window. Something had to hit the stereo. And why is the carpet all wet, Todd? I don't know, Margo. So back in the 1980s when I was a kid, a Bang & Olsen was sort of like a Nakamichi dragon. I believed it existed but never actually seen one in person. But now, thanks to the magic of eBay, I was able to get this one broken. And when we powered it up, we first just got clicks. And looking through the bottom, we could see the belts were clearly melted on this pulley. To open it up, we just needed to take out these two screws on the back and it sort of lifted up like a, the hood of a car or something. And inside you see acres and acres of circuit boards. Cool thing though, this is actually pretty easy to work on. They include this little stand, which lets you sort of prop up the front part and it just stands up in the air while you work on the back and the cassette mechanism down here at the bottom just removes pretty easily by removing three screws and two little pin connectors, one for the audio and one for the power. The uh, date stamp on the motor said that it was from December of 1979. During the disassembly process, I found this little weird piece loose in the box and it turned out to be some sort of guide rail and then there's a little ball bearing that went underneath it and helps the mechanism slide back and forth, but it seems to work pretty well without it. I might glue it back in at some point. The uh, cassette mechanism looks fairly standard. It doesn't strike me as particularly, you know, high end or anything. It's kind of idler driven and, you know, got a couple solenoids. I put new belts on there, cleaned up all the old gunk and uh, put it back together and it didn't work. Hmm. So I pretty much got the same behavior with and without belts, which told me the motor wasn't turning. Uh, using a 9-volt battery, I hooked to some wires directly to the motor, and it did turn, so power wasn't getting there. Looking over at the circuit board to the left of the motor, I found a fuse. Popping the fuse out and checking the continuity, it looked like the fuse was blown. So doing some reading online, it seemed like there's some motor protection circuits or stuff like that. So... Uh, the belt may have gotten wound around there and put too much pressure on the motor and blew the fuse or whatever. Anyway, so after checking the continuity of the fuse, I replaced it 
and it started working. I did go have to go back and grease some of the little gears and things. So there was some dried grease to make fast forward and rewind work, but uh, it was actually, you know, pretty easy to work on, at least on the mechanical side. I didn't have to do anything really on the electronic side. So this is a very strange tape deck, and uh, let's look at some of the features which make it unique. Um, like for example, you got this button that says programming. You know what that is? That's just a lot of programming. Yeah, I, I may do that for a living, but this is actually just a simple mechanical switch that opens the lid. The, yeah, there's no programming involved there. I guess you're actually programming the tape deck with these buttons and that's why. And it also has this all these instructions printed underneath the the lid which is unusual and it's kind of hard to read at the angle but you can kind of look and see it tells you how to operate it one of the things you program is the timer so you can set the time and have it come on and off at a certain time to like if you want to record a radio program so i'm going to set it the current time to 17 11 and i'll set it to come on at 17 12 and turn off at 17 14. it's a 24 hour clock you know so it's not a.m. p.m. Cool. And you gotta. Well, you could do a 24-hour box for sounds like what Papa Jake does. So he can just set that and then. I don't. I don't think they make a tape that a tape that could record record for 24 hours. You know, but this yeah. is not auto reverse. That's one of the things it doesn't do is auto reverse. So you could probably only record for like 60 minutes. But I'm not sure what the advantage of doing it this way. It's kind of cool to have it in in the tape deck. And notice that uh, you turn it off, program the time. And, and then you... if you press stop or something, it's going to turn back on. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Okay, so it turns on and starts recording. And then uh, two minutes later, it turned off. That seems to work fine. I don't know if you did use this rather than an external timer. I guess you'd have to synchronize clocks with the external timer. Or just I thought that tuner. button that was a record button to me. That's a good point. Yeah, that little dot. Yeah, if you noticed when I turned it off there to record... <sighs> It, the, that symbol is generally used on other tape decks for record, but this is the power off button. Once you power it off, you also can't power it back on, which is unusual. You have to press one of these other buttons at the bottom. Like stop like, or something? Yeah, to turn it back on. So that's kind of weird. And I think on the later models, they actually put the word standby on that button. But, you know, this Standby. Yeah, so it's basically like an off button. One of the other unique things about this tape deck is its implementation of music search. Normal music search... You just go forward or backwards and it detects the blank space. This, you enter a time. Today, um, you go to your YouTube account and you search video music. Yeah, well, obviously that's a lot easier. So at this point, I, I said, hey, I want to hear three minutes and 54 seconds. And I hit go and it rewinds to the very beginning of the tape and then does some fast forwards past the leader, I guess. And then, and then it'll fast forward uh, to that time I'm on the tape. So you put the tape in in the middle of it and it has to go back to the beginning to learn about it. But, and it, it says in the manual, you know, it has to be cognizant of the tape, which is weird. And how accurate is this? I actually just timed, you know, about 12 minutes into the tape. And it was pretty accurate within, you know, maybe 10 seconds or less. Most pre-recorded tapes don't actually come with a list of where things are in the tape. You know, so this, I'm not, it's kind of a cool idea, but I'm not sure uh, how, how useful it is. Also, once it has rewound to the beginning, it has, you know, a little computer, so, it's, so it remembers where it is. I asked for three minutes and 54 seconds, and this, it got there, and this is a, a, a loud concert, but it didn't start playing till the exact time. So in other words, let's see, let's jump forward to 745, and I'm at 6-something, so now I'm fast-forwarding. The tape deck will start playing ahead of the time you want, but then it just enables the audio, which is unusual. I guess it, it, it thinks it's precise, so you, it, it tries to be precise. So in conclusion, what do we think of this tape deck? It's, well, they're going to make a weird speaker that's $3,000 for free shipping. If you oh, yeah. Know. Yeah, the company's still around today and still makes some pretty avant-garde stuff. But the but, owners are not. But looking at this tape deck, the scale of it's kind of interesting. If you had two of them, you're talking about dedicating a whole lot of square footage to this versus traditional... We bought two and they cost a lot. We didn't buy two. I just used uh, copy-paste. But yeah, normal components you can just stack up. So... Is this a good tape deck? Is it just some sort of like, it's the most ridiculous, pretentious thing you've ever seen? I don't know. I, th I think they're kind of, kind of trying to do like Apple and isolate you from the experience and let the computer control everything. I uh, actually looked up the weird speaker on an old Apple iPad. We'll leave you with some audio samples of this tape deck. Thank you for subscribing. This We got our first ever revenue from this channel, and so we split it in half. I got this tape deck. I got actually saw, uh, two airplanes and two Fortnite figures. 
You mean these Fortnite figures? Uh, yeah. Why are they all... Why did they find the tape deck? Oh, no. Ah! <laughs> See you next time. Eliminated. Eliminated. <laughs> oh, no.